as one of the associate directors here at the Royal Court. Uh, I'm also uh, the director of uh, Barbers and Sons by Gary Owen, which I think hopefully you're all here to see tonight on some other night. Um, I'm very excited for, to have you all here for one of our Big Idea events. Now, Big Ideas are regular events that we present in order to stimulate thinking outside of the play's remit, to stimulate it by the play. Uh, and I'm really excited to be able to sit here and chair a discussion with the wonderful <coughs> man sitting next to me, who I will introduce you in about a second. As soon as I realised I was going to work on this play, um, I automatically knew that I wanted to contact this man sitting next to me to pick his brains about his specialty. Um, the man sitting next to me is Jonathan Asser, uh, he's a psychologist and a film writer and a poet. Uh, Jonathan wrote um, the very successful film, Starred Up, which I don't know if any of you saw, but uh, as soon as I saw that and I read some interviews with Jonathan about his particular work, working with prisons, uh, with a form of therapy that you've developed called Shame Violence Intervention. Is that correct? Yeah. Brilliant. So um, I read how he talked about it and was really interested in it and, was, and could connect it very much with any times that I've behaved inappropriately in my life and could understand it. So I wanted to understand more in order to understand what this play is about. Now really brilliantly, Jonathan has not seen the play, although he did come to rehearsals. So we're going to try and not talk about the play because I'm right in saying that most of you haven't seen it. Is that correct? Yeah, brilliant. So we're going to try and avoid... Pardon? Yeah. You've seen it, brilliant. So if you can avoid any spoilers, the <coughs> ah. responsibility is on you. <laughs> so what we're here to do is to talk specifically... Violence. <laughs> we do know, obviously, there is a small clue in the title, I'm aware of that. It is called Violence and Sons. And this is part of a, uh, a, a group of sessions that we're running for, for Violence and Sons. Uh, the other one we do, which is really exciting, called Power and Consent, uh, with Dr... Susan Hansen and Dr. Jackie Gray. So we've really tried to look at different ends of how violence affects different people. So the first question I'd like to ask you know, is, what yeah. could you describe to us what violence is? Because having spoken to you about it, you see it slightly differently, I think, for most people. Um, I guess in terms of my prison work, um, violence was simply in relation to three offences happening in, in the jail. So assault, fighting, and threatening behaviour. So what might be slightly different about that is it's not necessarily... I mean, I take emotional violence uh, very seriously, um, just as seriously as physical violence, in a sense. And in a way, emotional violence can sometimes be even more damaging than physical violence, because if physical violence has taken place, one can see that the blood or the bruises and the psyche can um, begin to possibly metabolize and work through what's what's happened whereas in emotional violence it can be denied and lied about and then that can mean it's even harder for the psyche to um, metabolize what's what's taken place and and to move on from it uh, in, in due course so that, that would be I guess an opening thing for me to say is that, that in talking about violence uh, the emotional side is, is very very important as well as the physical side. And what do you see, so your work, uh, shame, violent intervention, can you talk to us a little bit about where that came from, where you, where you yeah. got the idea from? Yeah, well that idea came from working in prison, and if um, one screens out psychotic prisoners who perhaps shouldn't even be in prison, but should be in a mental health facility specifically designed to, to work with mentally disturbed people, if we, if we take them out, then every single violent incident that I ever came across in about 12 years of working in the prison system had what I would call a shame trigger to it. So shame was a causal factor in the violence that happened. And when I'm talking about shame, I'm talking about um, respect, essentially. So that, that sense of feeling disrespected, of somehow not having one's place in the hierarchy honoured and acknowledged. And certainly in a prison setting, body language is very important. And one can signal uh, respect or disrespect in very nuanced, tiny ways, um, often with a, a look or um, a gesture, with, without even necessarily saying it. And um, yeah, how, did you, how, did, so how do you use your shame techniques to, to manage the violence? 
Well, I think the, um, if you, one could perhaps think of shame as being on a continuum, so shame's at one end, and then pride is at the other end. And so, in a sense, pride can be seen as the antidote to shame. Um, and what comes with pride is, is a sense of belonging. So um, the way that I try to, I mean, what, what I should perhaps say is what was different about my work was that I was working with prisoners currently being violent in the system. So I was possibly unique in, in that, in, in the country, in that if a prisoner commits an assault or a violent offence of some kind, what tends to happen is they're punished and sometimes placed in segregation and certainly removed from normal uh, programs such as education. Even if a prisoner was on a course designed to um, help that prisoner become less violent, if he commits a violent act in prison, he'd be removed from that, that program. Um, so what I was doing differently was I was specifically targeting prisoners currently being violent and working with them um, exclusively and taking them out of segregation and bringing them together. So what would happen would be we would get escalation and things would get close to the edge of violence and then um, we would de-escalate what was happening so that those um, prisoners could live safely <coughs> together on the same wing without having to be shunted around the system. And what enabled me um, to do that was primarily was being shame aware. So understanding and connecting with those shame dynamics, those respect dynamics, which is what it's all, all about. And secondly, working with a sense of belonging. So it, in a way, my therapeutic program operated as one might almost say a super gang where people involved in different gang dynamics who couldn't meet each other any other way safely could come together in my program and share a bigger sense of belonging um, together than, than what they could uh, access in their own separate affiliations. So when working with shame or working with violence, for me it's always about a sense of belonging and trying to create a sense of belonging that's shared uh, across a wider spectrum of people because um, the sense of belonging is as important to the psyche as food or water is to the body and if we don't get a sense of belonging then we're going to find one somehow we can't exist without one and if we experience the mainstream as somehow rejecting us then the sense of belonging that, that we connect to will be hostile to that mainstream and that's what motivates um, criminal networks and criminal dynamics on an emotional level. Can you give me a, a, a broken down example of that, you mean be isolated from, from a sense of belonging? Um, well, let's, let's say, um, I mean, I could use myself as, as an example from the sort of um, posh, rich end of society. I was sent away to boarding school at eight years old which is you know, a very expensive way to be educated. Um, and uh, at the same time, that boarding school experience of being brought up in care in institutions links to the experience that people have, if you like, at the other end of society, who are poor and without funds, who may end up in the care system for um, uh, economic reasons or, or other reasons related to that. However, the connection that that, that both ends of the spectrum share is that, that sense of being institutionalised. And, and what um, uh, institutionalisation is about, it's about attaching to the institution in place of the family. Right. So, so when I'm talking about alienation, I'm talk, basically talking about a, a family experience that in some way has been fractured or broken um, in a literal sense with, with absentee parents or, or carers or in a psychological sense when it's, it's simply not um, uh, safe to, to share or to trust, um, particularly in relation to, to shame dynamics and possibly the most contemptuous um, types of, of interactions. Contempt is um, uh, an extreme form of shaming of somebody and, and contempt I think is possibly the most cor corrosive, I didn't say courageous, which is <laughs> rather profound Gordian slip on my part. Um, it's, it's the most corrosive um, emotion that one can, I think, can, can fly around a, 
found in the setting. And why do you think why do you think that the shame dynamic is so specific to men? I'm not even personally sure that it is actually. I'm, my experience is of, of working with, with men, um, but I, I wouldn't claim that uh, it's something exclusive to men uh, at all, actually. I think, I mean, the flip side of shame is that if we can become shame aware and acknowledge our shame and connect with our shame, it becomes a very, very useful tool because uh, what shame does is it, it gives us instant feedback on, on the situation that we're in and it one can see it as acting as a signal of threat um, to what levels of trust are possible in any given situation. So if I feel a mounting feeling of shame, uh, that can be a signal to me that this is, I need to do something to impact on this situation and build relationships so that trust can be possible. So I, I guess shame awareness is, is, is a great thing. I, I believe it's possibly an evolutionary adaptation to working uh, together as in hunter-gatherer groups, so that shame would be a signal of um, threat, and then it's that signal that enables people to mobilise to try and organise themselves together in, in a more effective, more, more trusting way. So on, on that basis, it, it would be very much <coughs> an emotion shared between both sexes. To um, talk about the, the history of, of shame dynamics and where that comes from in relation to the social context. Can you talk to me more interestingly about fight and flight? Yeah, well, I guess in terms of my prison work, um, yeah, I, I guess one way into that is to think of um, if <coughs> someone has been brought up in a, a situation where the threats to those social bonds are very high and, and the, the ability to trust is, is very low, then th there's going to be uh, massive spikes of this, this shame signal sort of telling that person that th this is a very untrustworthy situation to be in. And that can cause an overload of, of shame. And therefore, in later life, uh, any experience of shame can be very, very threatening indeed. Because it can sort of take you right back into that really vulnerable situation. So I think that's possibly where the fight or flight reaction comes in. So if my shame now, as an adult, links to an unbearable childhood experience of shame, that feels so threatening to me that then it can trigger fight or flight response where I either want to get myself out of the situation or attack somebody and hurt somebody. Which is why it often leads to violence. Absolutely, yeah. So it's, it's all about enabling people to um, connect with their shame, become shame aware and uh, be able to live with their shame without being so terrified of it that they have to either attack or, or run away from it. Um, I think that's, yeah. How would you define shame? I think, I suppose for me, that shame is about context and interpretation. So if I feel I'm being interpreted within the context that I wish to be interpreted in, then I can feel a sense of pride. So if I want to be interpreted as a potent male, then I can feel pride around that. But then if something that happens that makes me feel that I'm being interpreted within a context of impotence, not necessarily in a physical, sexual sense, but in an emotional <coughs> sense or an intellectual sense, then it's shame that tells me that that contextual shift from potency to impotence has, has happened. So I, I guess that's, that's what shame, the shame emotion for me is, is, is about. It's about context and interpretation. So it all, always involves a viewer. Um, oh, right. Yeah. So when, and that viewer can be me. <coughs> I can be looking at myself or it could be somebody else looking at me in a certain way. And, yeah. So what are examples of that in the prison context that you worked in? Um, well, I mean, it could, could just be a look. You know, so um, I may wish to be interpreted within the context of being high status, and you may look at me in a certain way for a certain length of time that isn't um, commensurate with that sense of who I am. Um, you're taking a liberty, you're mugging me off, you're disrespecting me by looking at me for too long, or looking at me with a certain kind of body language. 
maybe I think you should be frightened of them, but you're not. You're appearing relaxed. That, that's offensive to me. That, that pushes me out of the context within which I wish to be interpreted. So that um, um, escalates my shame uh, reaction, which then, linked to my childhood trauma, then will induce me to, to attack you or, or run away from you and try and attack you later. But the thing about in prison is if, if you run away, it can be very dangerous because then you drop down the hierarchy and you can become food uh, for other people. Right. What, um, how did, so how did your sessions work in prison? How would, you say you talked to, because I've lucky enough yeah. to have seen the film before, mm. before, so you have a group, your group would be together. <coughs> Like well, a lot, happened, or a lot happened sort of before then. I had to go and unlock them and, and find, sort of find <coughs> a way of bringing them together, some going into segregation in one room. So it was a big uh, palaver to even get them to, to that room. It um, was, was a big piece of work. And uh, then, um, yeah. Sorry, the question. <laughs> what would you do in, so this, let's say if we were yeah. in a session now, yeah. what would we be doing? Well, we, we would be, um, I guess it all depends on, on what's happening in that, in that moment. So there may be a very big thing for me to deal with just in terms of the dynamics in getting to this room. Right. Okay. Uh, there may be you know, some, some stuff that I have to be really, really aware of. And um, so it's hard to, to generalize. I, th I think the whole essence of my work is it's all about what's happening now, this moment. And it's about what intervention you make right now in order to keep it safe, um, to help people learn to become uh, shame aware uh, so that they don't have to kick into that fight or flight response. So, um, it, that's not a very helpful no, that's response, brilliant. a bit too, too general, but it, it's very much about what's happening in the moment, and you, it, it's always happening, whether you're walking to it, in it, or, or walking back from it. But yes, there does come a time when, <coughs> when I would say, okay, I think we're going to start now, even though actually we start at the moment, um, I am not that, that first person. And then that is a signal for people to sit in a circle, and then it's a signal that, okay, we're going to move from people having their own conversations into having a conversation that's shared between all of us. And in a way, the point of that is it, it, it ups the ante. So because shame always involves <coughs> context and interpretation, somewhat a viewer of some kind, if we make it into a whole group discussion, there are more viewers. Yeah. So there's more at stake. Wow. So there's more potential for escalation. So you're purposefully, because you're getting the essentially the most dangerous people of all, in, in the prison together, which would never normally happen. Yeah. People that are normally all isolated for whatever reason and are banned from group activity. So you're so purposefully it's high there being violent. Yeah. yeah. So you're purposefully bringing in those people who will obviously all have very a very strong idea of their own context. Very strong. Yeah. Very, and then you're so and the point of your work is to bring them all together to bring those risks against each other, that, so that you can then manage it in the moment. That's certainly one way of, of looking at it. Um, I mean, a lot of care has to go into the selection because you, you do want somebody at a certain level in the hierarchy because for someone else it might be traumatic and it might be too frightening and too difficult to, to work with. But yes, for people who, who are isolated, who are not enabled to integrate and interact, it, it can be an R of a, a certain position in the hierarchy, then it, it can, can be a potentially liberating experience for them because they can get into confrontation and they can walk away from that confrontation without any loss of status and without having to look over their shoulder about what might happen next as a result of this. That's, you actually build that bigger sense of belonging in, in the program through going through a process of escalation and de-escalation. Absolutely. So with escalation, that means we're having a conversation that might be dangerous about something that might, for example, upset me. <coughs> yeah, yeah. <coughs> escalation, I guess, is, a, is about when status becomes uh, in the balance, when it right. could go either way. And the normal way to resolve that would be through violence. And then we're in the heat of the moment, and then it's about seeing if we can resolve it another way.
Why does why does that change of social context result in violence? Is that about me shaming? If you're sh if I feel shamed by you, if I punch you, why does that fix my shame? Um, wow. Okay. So that's quite a big big jump yeah. into into that. Okay. So um, I think that's about um, appearing active as opposed to passive. So a big aspect of shame is. You know, coming back to that impotence example, is is a, a feeling of exposure, a, a, a feeling of passivity, <coughs> of that wish to be seen in a potent context as in an active, dynamic context, but something happening to um, make me feel that somehow I'm exposed and unable to act. Um, so that's where I get that shift from that that pride feeling to that shame feeling. So the the shortcut to sort of um, uh, to resolve that it is to become violent because then I appear active, I, I appear dynamic, I, I appear in control of the situation and by becoming violent the, the shame that I feel is then located in my victim who has to um, take on my passivity and exposure and vulnerability that I was feeling and in, in shaming them through an active uh, violent process, I, I regain my sense of, of pride. <coughs> and it sends a, a powerful signal to others that, that if, if you know if, if you want to do this, then fine, but this is what's going to happen to you. Wow. And talking about... Um, can I just say something, just to come back to where we were so yeah, before? Yeah. Because of the, the people I was working with would know each other and they would all have a sense of rival with each other, um, towards the top of that pecking order. It's not as if they're coming in. They know what's at stake, and, and they're trusting me by coming into that space. And um, it's not as if people are looking for stuff to go off, as it were, at all. But inevitably, <coughs> stuff will, over time, just given the nature of the people and the context and the setting. But primarily, what one is looking for, what I'm personally looking for, or even in my own life, in that it worked for me as much as, as anyone else, uh, presumably, for, possibly for different reasons, but it certainly worked for me, was I was looking for a sense of belonging. So I was looking for a sense of purpose. I was institutionalized through the boarding school system. I found it hard to cope in the outside world and to engage emotionally and to understand what normal intimate relationships, family relationships were about. But this world I could really connect with. And so it was about trying to do something useful with that world um, and, and gain a sense of belonging for myself. And, and indeed, you know, if, if it worked for other people and they gained a sense of belonging from it, then, then, then great. Have you thought about practicing it outside of prisons? Um, I've thought about it, but I think it's, it's quite complicated to, to do that because in, in a prison situation, you know where everyone is. So, um, I wouldn't leave the jail until whatever had escalated was thoroughly de-escalated and thoroughly safe. Whereas oh, okay. in an outside, people can can head off and you just don't know where, where they <coughs> are. And, and so it, it, it makes that harder. Um, but, but sadly, my, my work was, was stopped. Um, so I, that, I'm unable to, to continue that. And what the, the the, um, the trigger for stopping it was actually a link between gang dynamics and radicalization dynamics in prison. Really? Yeah, so I think to some extent the prison service always found it quite hard to sort of get their heads around what I was doing, but I was unable to uh, keep developing it because the, the prison where I worked was threatened with privatization and my proposals to make the prison safer were accepted as part of the deal to keep it in the public sector. That, and people wanted to be in the public sector for better paying conditions. Um, and however, it was the counter-terrorism, it was counter-terrorism officials who became interested in my work, <coughs> and perhaps were the people closest to understanding what, what it was about, and understanding the importance of that sense of belonging, because they were experiencing it in their, their counter-terror work. And so um, they were concerned about links between gang culture and the potential to commit terrorist acts. Because it's, we remember it's all about that sense of belonging. And if my sense of belonging is hostile to the mainstream, that's what motivates me to attack people. And I can 
the exchange of street level sense of belonging related to gang culture for a higher level sense of belonging uh, related to um, religious extremism. And it's, 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 it's on a psychodynamic level, it's a very easy transition to make. So they were fascinated by the work and by the access that I had. And um, I introduced them to ex members of the group, and then they said, Well, could we possibly come in and, and see it? see it in action. And um, when I informed the prison of that visit, that's when they withdrew my security clearance uh, the next day. Wow. Uh, yeah. And so 12 years work ultimately um, finished. And the counter-terrorism people even went to see the black government said, do you really think you, sh you should be stopping this because it could be very important in the future? But um, they still went ahead for reasons that don't actually add up, administrative reasons that don't add up. Before I carry on, because I've talked to John about it all day, has anyone got any questions? Um, so far, there's been quite a lot of talk about sort of consequence management, like dealing with it as it happens. Have you thought about the blood group? How are you interested in going into working with the flip side of that, like dealing with younger guys or before it happens, or you know, childhood situations? <coughs> how do you stop it before it develops into yeah, an issue? Well, I, I guess just on a, a sort of common sense level, as I think you're, you're pointing out, is the earlier you can get in there, yeah. the, the better, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, sadly, I'm now a, a screenwriter, and my, I feel sort of everything's changed. So, I mean, it's weird how the world of entertainment, if you like, is far more interested in my insights and skills than, than the world of um, the criminal justice system, for example, or the world of, of care and rehabilitation. But you're absolutely right, yeah definitely get in as early as possible. What do you think should be done? What's the way to deal with it? Um, well, I'll tell you one thing that I think should be done is I think it should be illegal to expel children from mainstream school. And I think that schools uh, should be uh, compelled to continue to work with, uh, for example, violent ch children or unruly children. Uh, so I think it's doesn't make sense for schools to be judged on solely on academic achievement, for example, <coughs> because then that motivates the school to get rid of the people who are damaging the, uh, the you know, how many A stars you get or yeah. whatever it is. I think schools should also be judged on their ability to work with um, violent and aggressive kids, for example, antisocial kids or gang-related kids or whatever it is. And it should be compulsory that they stay within the mainstream system because I think once that fault line between the mainstream and the the pupil referral unit or whatever the, the current term is is for them uh, into the secure unit and fell term that that that's the sort of fault line that we need to make <coughs> sure doesn't happen and then we need to do everything we can to reintegrate people maybe they can't be in the mainstream classroom but they <coughs> need to be in the mainstream building mm -hmm with a route back into that mainstream classroom if, if one can be facilitated. Yeah. Have you got any any thoughts on what should be done? I think it's difficult. I think um, sticking to the conversation about men specifically, mm. I think from a really young age there's that whole thing about emotions and not being allowed to show your emotions and mm. so when they do feel emotional it's a vulnerability which creates shame, which creates violence. Mm. So I think it's sort of about just letting them be a bit more soft <laughs> when they're really young and but saying it's okay. Mm. Maybe it's linked to what you're saying. It's about sort of, uh, foregrounding emotional intelligence as a, as a very important aspect of intelligence as opposed to perhaps minimising its importance in, in favour of other mm. forms of intelligence. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I just wondered if the men in your group, were they there uh, sort of voluntarily because it was a break from segregation in a way, or did they have to go and were there consequences for not participating? No, with working with the, in the way that I was working, on, on the edge that I was working on, with the risk that I was managing, you have has to be volunteers. Um, but actually, um, Broadly speaking, when a violent incident happened, there were two types of prisoner that I came across. And one would be a prisoner who 
might be quite anxious about the violence that had taken place, quite concerned about the impact on his sentence, and uh, keen to convey um, possibly not remorse, but, but, but definitely <coughs> worried about what was going to happen next. You know. um, and then the other type of prisoner that I might encounter would, would greet me, and I would never unlock the door initially in terms of our first conversation, would, would greet me with a very flat look, sort of dead emotionless look, um, not concerned about what had happened, um, not interested in what I had to say. And it was essentially that brutalized, institutionalized prisoner that was the person that, that was suitable for my program, for what I was doing. And, and once I explained to them, well, what I do is I go around, the reason why I'm here is you were involved in a violent incident. What I do is go around and speak to prisoners who are currently involved in violence, and I bring them together and it can get quite heated at times, but we try and find a, a way through. And that would tend to be when that, that type of prisoner would start to look at me as if, if I was mad, mm -hmm. basically. But at, at the same time, there was a sort of spark of interest there. This, well, this is different. You know, this, what's, what's he about? And because um, that institutionalized, often brutalized prisoner was very conversant with the language of violence and had a strong sense of being able to handle himself in violent situations. Um, he, he might, well, he, in, in fact, every single, I never met a prisoner like that who didn't want to participate, to be honest. Um, so essentially they chose themselves for the right reasons and they sort of had an instinctive understanding of um, what, what was appropriate and what wasn't. Does that mean that you wouldn't choose, you wouldn't choose the, the first example of prisoner that you explained to us? Well, he, you know, beautifully, he wouldn't choose himself either. Right. You know, if, what, for that type of reason, I said, well, what I do, I go around, take people currently involved in violence, and bring them together. And he's just like, well, that, that's, I'm not interested. You know, that, that's, that's mad. Yeah, so, so they, you know, they very much choose themselves. I, I don't think I ever had to say to anyone, you, you, can't, you can't join, um, as it were. Yeah, they, 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 they knew what was right for them. Um, I was wondering about, I was thinking about the context of this play and the family context of it and um, and how shame works into it without spoiling anything. Um, is there anything that you would say from your work that um, that you think we could all think about as people who are not in institutions about how we deal with shame or how we encourage other people to think about it or if we're parents how you deal with that topic with children, that sort of thing. Well, perhaps I could sort of throw throw that back to you, maybe, and, and sort of how in touch do you feel with your with your shame? Does, does, is that something you you're in touch with and aware of? Yeah, I think yeah. so. I just think I'm I'm thinking well, more specifically about children and what do you do okay. to interview? Well, that that's really all there is to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's simply you're you're in touch with your shame. You're aware of your shame. So therefore. Um, as a role model, you, you're the perfect role model. It's, it's about shame awareness. So I don't think you actually have to say anything. It's just about being, you know, and it's, that will communicate itself somehow. And, and that's, it's simply about being able to, 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 to be aware of that shame. And as, as we were saying, you know, if, if you go into that fight or flight response, um, then the moment's lost. But if you can stay with that shame, Whatever you do, staying with that awareness of that shame is, is going to be beneficial because that will enable who, the people around you to develop that capacity them, themselves. And if you were going into a context, say, where you hadn't had contact with someone and then you, I'm just thinking about the play again, and then suddenly you were in their life and you realised they had a negative reaction to, that, reaction to shame, is that just all about a prolonged series of examples or is there sort of direct things that you would imagine you could do? Um, <coughs> I don't know. Uh, I think I'd sort of almost come back to what I, what I said before. I think you just can, you can just stay in touch with it in yourself. You can only manage yourself in a sense. You know, it's almost up to other people to manage themselves and, and you can just be, be yourself and if you can be shame aware then people will 
will be able to take that on board and and, and learn from that. When you're saying shame aware, is that about being in control of your shame or just knowing that um, it exists? Not necessarily in control, but aware of it. Like when you go into that fight or flight response, that's when the, the shame is so threatening because it takes you back into that childhood trauma, the shame experience, which was unbearable. So you can't be aware of that shame. You, you run from that shame through violence, for example, or through retreating. Um, so the great is when you're shame aware, what you can do is you can confront people and you, you can stick it on people, you know, in a, in a helpful way. Uh, uh, because, because what are the alternatives? Violence towards them, which, which doesn't help anybody, that switches off their capacity to think and feel, switches off mine. But if I can stay aware of this shame signal, then connect my brain to it and confront somebody, um, then I'm not being violent, I'm also not running away, which uh, is also not helpful. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so uh, you're helping, um, someone's helping me, your help, right, your shame awareness sat there is helping me put work, work it through in myself, so now I can now add that it's about being shame aware and confronting when appropriate, but that's an example of what I'm talking about, it's your, your ability to stay with that shame, that sense of exposure, that awkwardness, that struggle in the moment which you express through your body language and which one can pick up on instantaneously, that's, that's enabled me to uh, make some links there. So that, that's a, a living example of it in action. Great. Okay. Yeah, question. Yeah, I was just going to ask, in the work that you did, was mm. there any um, evidence or feedback that allowed you to know the changes you were making with these men? And is there any aspect to what you've done, obviously we're not trained, but for people that work with young men in the community, mm. to get to use some of what you do to kind of manage? Um, well, in terms of the, the evidence for uh, <coughs> change, I think is the word, um, really what I was setting out to do was um, simply to make the prison a safer place. So I didn't make any claims that this will change people's lives and they will become less violent. Um, that's possible, maybe, maybe not. But what I did say was, this will make the prison safer because we'll, what what happens <coughs> in prison is is we concentrate dangerous people, then violence happens that wouldn't have happened between these individuals if we hadn't concentrated them in the way that we had, and then the prison system simply puts pulls them apart. You're on that wing, you're on that wing, you go to that prison. And so a problem we've created is never dealt with, it's passed down the line, and then something happens, violent, you know, could involve the mem members of the public after their release. So on that sort of basic level, I, was, I wasn't making big claims, I was merely talking, saying this, this is a, a sane way of operating. Um, however, there, were some, there was an evaluation done that, that was, was promising, and really the, the biggest, um, I also won the Innovation Award Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy, so it was acknowledged as a, as a national innovation. Uh, but I think the biggest demonstration of the effectiveness of what I was doing was there wasn't blood on the walls, literally, in that the people I was working with were deemed too dangerous to bring together at that time in their sentence, given that what they were doing in the prison at the time. And yet we never had a contact, physical violent incident, in any session, uh, and we never had a contact physical violence incident between sessions involving active participants on the program. Um, so I think that was that was the biggest thing. And then, what what can one do uh, in relation to other work? Is there anything you can take from yeah. what what I'm talking about? Um, I guess again, it links to that 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 shame awareness was 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 the key, and I I can now say shame awareness combined with confrontation. Uh, so, and confrontation isn't punishment. Confrontation is, um, it's really, I, I need to do more work to sort of define it for myself, but it, it's about um, feeling that escalation of shame in oneself, acknowledging, okay, there's, there's a threat to this bond that I have with this person, and doing something about it in the moment. That, that's really what that shame awareness does, it enables you to act in the now, 
and make something happen. Uh, but I, I appreciate that's incredibly vain. I'd say another way of looking at it is it's about working with that sense of belonging. So if there is someone who's particularly disruptive, you know, is there a group setting that they can be involved in? Can they uh, almost have a sense of responsibility in that group for other people in that group? Can I mean, in a way, what I was doing in the prison was sort of taking the, the most um, potentially violent in the prison and enabling them to become positive role models, if you like, to use that background and that, that profile and that history um, in a positive way. Um, so maybe it's about creating a context that, that people can feel a sense of belonging within, and then that will motivate them to protect that sense of belonging and try to work in a more pro-social way. When you, do, when you worked with the uh, event, did you actually actively talk about shame? About the ideas no, of hardly ever, hardly ever. Mm. So if someone was about... That, sorry, that links to that thing, it's about <laughs> shame being aware and using that, that potent confrontation as opposed to violence or running away. And But one doesn't even need to talk about it, I think, especially within that culture, which is a very much a respect culture and a, and a sense of a hierarchy and a sense of what's due and a sense of honour. Everyone's very plugged into it anyway. In a, no, no, it's brilliant. In a moment of escalation, what would, you say, <coughs> what would you say to a gentleman if you saw that he was... It's not so much about what he says, it's about what you do physically with your, your body language. That's, that's the, the key thing. And even sort of putting my body in that space um, is, a, is a big statement of trust that, um, that I feel we can get through this. I feel I can get through this somehow. Because I'm not violent. I'm not from a violent setting. I've never had a fight in my life. I'm frightened of violence. So I'm not, I don't have any of the qualifications that they have in, in the violence field. And yet I'm, I'm here sitting in this room and I feel there's something that that we, we can all get through this, especially me as, you know, essentially the most vulnerable person here when it, when it comes to violence. Um, so, yeah, so that's a, in itself is a big statement for body language. Um, and really, I guess, the next key thing is that what I am always was always trying to do is to, A, be shame aware, so sort of read those shame levels. So. It could be that things were pretty active and people were out of their chairs and gesticulating, but the, the shame level that I'm feeling is very low. So I, I'm, I'm aware that this is not particularly high risk, even though it looks like it is. Um, or it could be everyone sitting <coughs> down quietly, but I've got a very high sense of shame in myself, and so I know this is really very dangerous, and something really could go off and it, it could be bad, unless the right interventions are made. And that really consists about trying to work out who's bringing the shame and pressure. So the violence will only happen when someone experiences a shame overload, because shame is the cause of violence. So if I can just be aware of who is bringing that shame and pressure, then I can confront them about that. And in this setting, confrontation can simply just be looking at someone for half a second, because the that can be a very powerful thing to do in prison, is to look at somebody. And how you look, how long, uh, is, 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 a, is a whole is a whole world around that. And you can get that body language right just through being shame aware. So if I look at that person for a sort of microsecond longer, then I become the problem, because I'm looking at him. You know, why are you looking at me? So the focus is, is on me now, and then I can I can work with that person around that and, and he knows I'm not going to become violent and maybe there's some way we can, we can de-escalate. So it's all about body language and con confront confronting the person bringing that shame and pressure and that then gives the person who's under most pressure from the shame being brought in, if you like, to just regroup while I'm, I'm confronting whoever it is. And then it may, and it's always switching, so that the guy I'm confronting then may become the most vulnerable to a shame overload, and then it's about confronting who's whoever's trying to get into him at this moment. So There's a big ball of shame, and you're chasing it around the room. Yeah, it's it's um, a yeah. sort of wave of, of shame almost. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. 
And the lady over there, yeah, and I'll come over there. Great. Um, Henry said you were in rehearsals. I just wondered what your role and input were in the rehearsal process. Yeah, it turned out to one, didn't I? I think maybe that's more for you to reason. I mean, I found it fascinating, the, you know, to connecting with the material that's, that, that, that I saw, and I, I really enjoyed it. And the, and the connection between Shane and Barnes was very, very, very apparent, so I had immediate respect for the writer on, on that basis. Uh, yeah, so we brought, uh, brought Jonathan in in order to talk about the theories that he's talked about now, and for us to be able to understand. I think what it, what's so brilliant about the idea of Shane Barnes' mm. intervention for me was that it can happen when you talk about it today, to put the beginning about the violence, a violent act isn't necessarily a physical violent act, and that happens in lots of different ways. And for us to understand and trace that through in the play was very, very useful. And what was brilliant about that was a great moment in rehearsals where Jonathan, we thought the shame in that moment was just happening between the protagonist, you know, two of the protagonists, but he he actually saw that in that little scene that we showed you that there was lots of other versions of shame going on at the same time and how that was being passed around. Um, and it's very much about like an you could describe it in the acting terminology, you know, as an you could use it as an action, couldn't you, to, to shame if we if we were breaking things down to, as as that. I mean, so that's how we sort of for that session used it. And often it became a vocabulary for our rehearsal after Jonathan left. Mm -hmm. We would always be able to go, right, brilliant, because it was a, a language that had been created. Mm -hmm. And everyone responded really well to Jonathan, obviously, because he's a lovely human being. So and it made sense and they trusted him, so we were able to bring that. Right, okay, I think, what's the shame level here? Okay, right, one more, and we could work out. Oh, it was really, really, really useful. Really and I think there's a real potential for it yeah. in that, in a, in a further way. It was really yeah. for us. Yeah. And we have one more question? I was just going to ask you, um, obviously you're trying to help these people break the sort of cycle of violent behaviour, and I wondered how are all of these men have they experienced violence in childhood, or have some of them not? And all, all the people I work with experience very high levels of violence in childhood. Yeah. Particularly in fact physical violence and as, as, you know, on top of the emotional violence, yeah. Because I was reading something about Shane a couple of years ago, it was with, with, in relation to addiction and you know people yeah. repeating patterns and it, it was talking about how often if you know, when people say, Oh you've had your your father's been an alcoholic, so you think the last thing you'd want is to repeat that pattern. Mm. But the child observe the shame of the parent and the behaviour of the parent and internalises the parent's shame and then repeats yeah. that pattern yeah. when, when they're older. Yeah. So it's obviously quite difficult if you've inherited if those patterns from as, as, as early as oh, you've yeah. been taught them to know it's hard to. Sometimes it's hard to, like all things, you only really understand your childhood when you're an adult and you're looking back and mm. you're maybe trying to look into issues or address things or think about things? Yeah, I, I guess for me in my work we were literally trying to get through the session without the violence happening, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. on that very basic level, um, which in, I guess in some ways is much easier than, than the, the level of, of which um, you're talking about it. And I think physical enacted violence is um, possibly easier to work with than, say, um, uh, and which in itself can be an addiction, I guess. One can become addicted to that, that rush in relation to violence. Um, however, the, the, some of the, the scope of what you're bringing in in terms of drug addiction is, is way beyond my, no, my area of expertise. Like, you know, sometimes in a violent pattern, there's the kind of the falling out, the violence, the kind of making up all those patterns yeah. that people in the you domestic know, violence scene. Yes, yes, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And again, there's a difference here with this. Is This is more sort of, it, it, one could almost call it gang-related violence or hierarchy-related violence uh, between men in a, in a prison setting. And I think, yeah, that, that sort of more domestic kind of uh, ebb and flow of, of violence escalation, de-escalation, again, um, must be extraordinarily difficult to, mm -hmm. to deal with here. Yeah. Thank you all so much for spending the last 45 minutes with us, and a big thank you to Jackie for being so fascinating.